remember, you know, in 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 terms of, you know, Richard Ben Kramer had that, as you described, that theory that you have to know his the the name of the childhood pet, and then you know you're getting somewhere. A because it's a sign of how much you've talked to the candidate, but then also it becomes something like a skeleton key that helps you then unlock these other chambers um, of of the life and of the mind. And I, I've a, I can't remember who it was, but one of my colleagues. Um, I think at the New Yorker has a theory that you only know that you've really gotten to know a subject once you've seen them with wet hair, meaning that they haven't had a chance to kind of compose their public presence. Yeah. And, you know, and I have had that experience. There's a couple of people in the book, you know, I remember one sleeping on somebody's couch and I thought, okay, I think I'm getting to know this person. And, um, and then, of course, you also have to have that ability to then step back and say, okay, now where does that fit into the broader context? And you have to be able to have some critical distance to say, what do I make of this person's life and their choices? Um, maybe not in a judgmental way, but at least in a way that is analytically um, honest. I mean, the truth, and you're, you're, you're astute to notice that. But look, at the arc of this story, by the end, you know, I'm reporting on the events of January 6th, and they feel as if it is this kind of uncanny consummation, conflagration in the worst, saddest way of all of these things that I had been writing about and tracking. I mean, going back to the very first moments of beginning to write about the 2016 race in the sort of early moments of summer of 2015. So it all felt there was a kind of almost sense from, from, from my experience of a kind of tragic inevitability about it. And that in its own way, I had to take some time to process that. And, you know, writing is part of the processing of that experience. And then you have to be able to also say, but that's not the end. You know, if we've learned anything, it's that history actually has a way of pulling itself up and kind of roaring out of the river again, right? When you think you've, you've, you've drowned it. And actually there's this, there's this, I had this, you know, kind of con this, this conclusion in my own mind that, um, that the, the thing that actually distinguishes a, a state that, or a society that is capable of, uh, a bright future is its capacity for self-correction. And I say this partly having lived in China and, and lived in uh, places where the political system is almost engineered not to allow that capacity for self-correction. You know, we're right now the, you know, the Chinese Communist Party this fall is going to install Xi Jinping for a third term. And that's going to break the, what had been this tradition of only serving 10 years. And I, I do feel as we're kind of at this period where we're all thinking about, okay, how does the how does Western liberal democracy really stand up against systems, authoritarian models, whether it's Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin or what have you. And I think the 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 fact that for all of the pain and the drama associated with with the 2020 election and January 6th, that actually the fact that we did install uh, a new president after four years is a sign that um, the underlying instinct for self-correction remains. And that gives me a lot of hope. Today, There are those moments where you kind of feel as if we're this car that's kind of careening as close as you can to the cliff's edge. And you think, my gosh, maybe this is the moment. And then somehow the instinct of the herd, uh, you know, um, we're able to pull ourselves back. I mean, I think part of the reason why it, it's exhausting for us as Americans is because we do have this pendulous pattern in our politics where we're going from, all right, it's this type of person. And then it's this wildly different type of person and their character. And I mean, it, you know, to go from Barack Obama to Donald Trump to Joe Biden and you know, except for the fact that this is only 50% of the human population, uh, we're not able to somehow uh, bring ourselves to actually elect a woman president. But within that, you know, you do have this, this pendulous quality. And I think that is, it's, it's got everybody feeling on edge. Uh, so you know, part of the reason to write this book, honestly, was to take this, this, 
this enormously messy period of our lives and try to give it some form. I mean, that is the, that is the, that is the labor of the of writing, right? Is to say, I'm going to try to give it form. I mean, you're you're totally right to identify that's sort of the substructure of of this project was my realization that um, you know the United States is in many ways defined by place. We were blessed by geography uh, in ways that it's almost hard for us to really even remember as Americans because it just seems so natural. Of course, we would have two vast coastlines and this immense rich territory that has mountains and fertile uh, plains and everything in between. We take it for granted. It's only when you live in other countries and you live around the world that you sort of are reminded that, oh yeah, that's right. There is a reason why if you're in Lesotho or Belgium, you look at the United States as this really extraordinary piece of the planet. And, and somehow, you know, you also generate you know, we have Hollywood, we have Silicon Valley, we have these presidents, we have all of this dysfunction and drama, but we have all of this bounty. And I think there's a reason why, um, why, why, and then within the United States, I think our vastness actually then accentuates the power of place. Because if you are, and this is what's running through the book is, if you're a kid who is born on the south side of Chicago, um, you are an American. And if you're a kid who's born on Round Hill Road in Greenwich, you are an American. But um, we haven't really done the work to understand how those two experiences can actually fit together in a coherent America. And I think that's actually the point where we are. That was part of this process. You know, from my perspective, the most interesting thing was to, to get these places in, into conversation with one another on the page. I mean, Clarksburg, I mean, this will totally resonate with what you saw that in Clarksburg, there is this neighborhood called Quality Hill, which is the fanciest homes in town, these beautiful Victorians that were built in the heyday of the glass industry in the, you know, more or less the, um, you know, was, for a long time, the glass industry was really thriving. And now those Victorians are funeral homes, because that's the big business, you know, and so there's this, and you know, to this question of place, I was very kind of, I would often return to the, as, as almost as much of the geography as I could, because the geography, you know, whether it's the stone walls in Greenwich or these Victorians uh, that have become funeral homes in Clarksburg, it says so much, you know, um, we make the places and then the places make us. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that. I mean, I, I sort of have always, probably never quite understood what it means to go to journalism school because I just have my own dedicated professor if I ever have the question and I it's been a part of my life from long before I ever thought I would write and I am um, I mean I, I often think to myself if my father had been you know a cobbler I'd probably be fixing shoes but we in our family what we do is we go out in the world we talk to people write down what they say and try to make sense of it and I just um you know, and, and curiously enough, actually, if you trace our family back in, in Poland, you know, my father was a Polish Jew who, as you as you know from his work, he came to the United States. He was born in India on the way. But if you go back to the family before they left Poland, they were publishers and, and a bookstore owner. I mean, it was kind of, it seems to be in our DNA. We have, you know, I, I couldn't hit a jump shot if my life depended on it, but I can write books. That seems to be our, that seems to be our genetic um predisposition 